Good morning, everybody. Good morning, class. I'm supposed to say good morning, Mr. Reedy. So I'm just going to hop right into it. We have a lot of uh, material to cover, so as folks kind of shuffle in or shuffle out, please just do so quietly. Uh, first thing, kind of a quick disclaimer. Uh, quick first thing, I used to be the FBI CISO. I am now in my third week of my illustrious private sector career, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. You know, you guys pay a lot more when you're not a public servant. Uh, so a couple things there, just keep in mind, this is my stuff, my opinion. Uh, I was, of course, cleared by the Bureau, and the Bureau wanted me to give this talk. But do keep in mind, if you yell crap at me, I'm a private citizen now. So I get to respond and in, in, in such. I'm going to try to leave a couple minutes at the end for questions. Uh, but just a couple things. One thing, please no tinfoil hat questions. And tinfoil hat questions are anything about like the Kennedy assassination or aliens. And please nothing, if you, if you just want to rail against the man or the federal government, please do that after the show. I'd be happy to do that. Tell you what, you can buy me a drink at the bar and I will sit there as the avatar of the man and you could just kind of <laughs> heap. <laughs> and, and you can heap scorn on me. But you're buying the drinks. So what, what the whole point of this, uh, uh, this presentation is kind of condense 10 years of uh, things we learned at the FBI Inside a Threat program into five lessons in an hour. So we have kind of a lot to go over. A lot of it's not necessarily technical. Um, and just to kind of let you know why you should listen to me, right? So besides the fact that I have a PowerPoint and an awesome suit. Besides I have a PowerPoint and an awesome suit, I've worked kind of the front lines of insider threat for a better part of a decade in one of the only operational uh, federal insider threat programs. So uh, hopefully some of this will be uh, good for you. I'm not gonna go each, through each one of these, but uh, these are kind of the five lessons that I, I wish I knew. So if I could go back and talk to young Pat, besides telling him to kind of not get so rotund, one of the things I would have told him was these five lessons. Okay, and we're gonna go through each one of these, and at the end, we're gonna actually focus on some cyber indicators and observables that we found through some empirical evidence that uh, if you were starting an insider threat program, there'll be two types of data I would suggest that you start collecting, and only two, and we'll get to that. Alrighty, so just real quick, like kind of our, the evolution of our uh, IA program, we, we kind of follow this trajectory that a lot of IA programs, information assurance or cybersecurity programs, which by the way, I hate the term cybersecurity, uh, programs followed, right? We kind of started with network intrusion, worrying about viruses, kind of moved into this concept of APT or more advanced persistent threats. And you start gathering different data and thinking about things differently, right? For detection purposes, you get away from this kind of signature-based stuff. And by the way, and I'll get into this and I'll rail on this, you, you can't use snort SIGs to capture insider threats. You just, and I'd be happy to debate anybody on that. It's not the same type of problem, and we'll, we'll get into that. But as we kind of evolved, you get into these more like data mining techniques, behavioral analytic techniques, a lot of the stuff that generally us as, like, as security geeks don't normally do. And this is a particularly interesting problem for people that work in security operation centers that just get kind of thrown the insider threat program. But by way of hand, how many people work in a SOC, like a security operation center, that now has to do insider threat stuff? Couple, yeah, couple. It's really funny that they do that. I don't know why, but when, and we'll discuss some things that maybe will be useful to you. But I guess it's like, hey, nerds, you handle other things, now handle insider threat. Go be nerdlinger. Uh, so the approach for this talk, what we did, and I'll talk about this kind of Joe Friday stuff, right? Dragnet, just the facts. One of the issues that, that's a gigantic um, hurdle for insider threat research is a lack of empirical evidence. A lot of stuff that's written is based, it's either editorialization, it's based on a single, uh, like, uh, and a very small amount of test cases, and it's just kind of bad science, frankly. Uh, so what we wanted to do is start looking at empirical evidence and kind of driving that empirical evidence a little bit forward. So what we did is we took a look at 65 espionage cases that went back about 15 years. And we looked at just about every aspect we could, uh, if they're system admins or not, if, what kind of actions they did, et cetera. Then we took a, a control, I'm sorry, and then we also took a look at 200 what I would call non-model employees. These were incidents over about a three-year period at the FBI of people that had some kind of punitive action taken against them. So they could have lost their job, they could have been demoted, uh, they could have lost their clearance. This does not mean they were all spies. 
Because one of the big problems with the science of insider threat is you, spies are kind of rare, thankfully, or we're just completely missing them, either one. We don't have a lot of really good test cases. Um, and then what we did is so you have a test group and a control group, right? Pretty easy. Same way that they do with cancer, right? Lots and lots and lots of people with cancer, lots and lots of people without cancer, and compare the two and find diagnostics. Again, the issue we have here is that insider threats are so rare that we have a tendency to overly fit to problem sets, and we'll talk to that. Okay, so let's talk about the first lesson, the misunderstood threat. I, I jokingly call insider threat like the emo kid of threats, like no one understands it. One of, the, one of the problems is everybody always looks at this lens of all security problems are hackers, right? That's not the problem with insider threats. And we'll talk about it and I'll say this often. Authorized users doing authorized things for malicious purposes. They do not have to run hacking techniques. They do not have to do buffer overflows. They do not have to follow the kill chain. This is all things we'll talk about. Um, often also these are people that joined with no malicious intent and uh, had no concept of actually doing any harm to the organization when they entered. The other kind of fundamental shift that everybody as security professionals need to make is away from this kind of IP addressed and, and network centric view to people and critical data assets. And most places like in SOX or security, places, or security organizations don't have the information, simple information like HR information to say, you know, Pat Reedy is this guy, this is what he works on and this is what he normally should be doing, this is what he shouldn't be doing. And we'll talk to that. That was one of our, our critical and, and most difficult problems. Building an insider threat program at the Bureau is learning the people. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in the future slides. So let's talk about what it's not. It's not the knucklehead problem. Right? It's not stupid people. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of stupid people in the world. And in our incidents, and one of the, the, the incidents last year at the Bureau, about 24% of our incidents were people that were just doing unwitting dumb things. This is our standard user that, you know, hey, a, a pop-up of a talking moose wants my social security number. Sounds fair to me, and then, you know, and, and that, that kind of thing. Um, but we spent a lot of time on it. About 35% of our incident response time was handled just like telling people, uh, you know, uh, when talking moose pop up, don't give them their social security number, and uh, you know, please don't use the FBI to buy Wang enhancement pills. It's not the right place to do. So, what one of the nice things about this problem set is that we found ways to kind of socially, positively socially engineer, and we'll talk about that our user base to make room for our analysts to focus on the really hard problems. I'd argue this is the same thing with anything, advanced persistent threat, any incident, you have to take those things that, that you can automate out, take human hands off of, and uh, just kind of uh, teach your people. So it's not the knucklehead problem. Uh, this the other thing is, uh, I love this, I, I don't know why I love this so much, but I love this gigantic bear. So one of the, one of the things that people talked about often in, in these reports is insider threats are the most common. Well, I think this kind of goes back to this problem and no one agrees to what an insider threat is. Uh, somebody stealing a legitimate credential and then logging in and trying to do legitimate user things is not an insider threat. It's not. It's still an external threat actor using internal credentials. So this is one of the, this is one of the common mis misconceptions. So to kind of clear up that misconception, what I did and we did is we went through 14 open source uh, uh, reports all the big ones, right? FBI, CSI, Pwnmon, Verizon Data Loss, uh, and took a look at them at, at using 13 variables and tried to find out how often do malicious, that means knowingly malicious users, they did something on purpose, not necessarily to do damage to the company, but they did something on purpose, broke rules, stole data, et cetera. And it breaks down after over 1,900, 1900 incidents, we found about 19% of the incidents are malicious insiders, okay? So vast majority, not gonna be an insider. However, if you look at the financial damages, and we'll talk about this, the open source, and then some uh, FBI case statistics, they are the most costly. Average cost about $412,000 per incident, or $15 million a year for an average company. And it's about half that for external threat attacks. Some insider threat attacks have been shown to be over a billion dollars or approaching a billion dollars. LG is one of them in Korea. They claim that about $1.5 billion of intellectual property was stolen, uh, DuPont, there's, there's several that can go on and on and on. Uh, and then when you look at the case statistics, this is the Industrial Espionage Act 
1996 through present. The average loss is about $472 million. That's when it's brought to federal court and with the Industrial Espionage Act, there's a link to a foreign power for that insider. Um, when you look at the case statistics, 71% of them are coming from China. Now, I'm not saying anything against China. I'm just saying that these are, this is the, the, the statistics. And 29% 20, is all other. Uh, so $472 million loss, usually these are single incidents, uh, are pretty serious, right? Now, it's, I found it interesting that, I, I guess companies just don't bring anything to federal court until you lose like $400 million, and we're just eating the 15 million bucks. You know, 15 million bucks, you can still go away for a long, long time. So what is an insider threat, right? Well, it's pretty simple. We've talked about this a lot, or I'm gonna say this a lot. Authorized user doing authorized things for malicious purposes. When you go in with that hypothesis, it completely changes your detection and your incident response capabilities. Because if you, if you immediately start thinking like an intrusion prevention system is gonna help you do that, that's not gonna help you. People are not needing to do things like buffer overflows and, and, and they, they have access to the data they are stealing or that they are potentially damaging. Uh, it kind of boils down to an actor with legitimate access and has some kind of trust with the organization. And again, I, I rail on this just because, like, I understand, and we'll talk to, to kind of what vendors spin, um, but, you know, the again, the advanced persistent threat is not an insider threat because they use internal credentials, for example. The threat actor might actually be the same. You could have a bad guy out in a random country, fiction a stand, and they could either use cyber attacks against you or they might hire somebody internal. So maybe the, the ultimate threat is the same, but again, not an insider threat problem. And I kind of just frame that, did a quick threat tree here and down here. For the, how many folks that have read any Carnegie Mellon University's insider threat Stuff, yeah, great stuff. If you have anywhere that you want to, they probably have the go-to academic uh, uh, collection of insider threat cases, about 800 going back, I think about 10 years, maybe a little bit more, and they've come up with these different threat models, but essentially you're talking about an internal person with malicious uh, intent, and they kind of boil them down to these four key areas, espionage, IT sabotage, fraud and abuse, IP theft. I would argue you could add unauthorized disclosure, and again, I'm not going to get into to a, a big argument. Authorized disclosure for the purposes of whistleblowing or for the purposes of, of, of espionage or for whatever other reason, it kind of doesn't matter. That, that, that boils down to the human being. But um, unauthorized disclosure could probably be added there too. So that, that's kind of generally what we're going to be talking about. So one of the things I want to talk about is kind of like the evil sysadmin, right? I love this, by the way, internet memes. I can, I can sit up like hours a night, look up internet memes and giggle because I'm basically a 41-year-old man in a 12-year-old body. Uh, this is, so one of the things I want to do after Snowden is there's a lot of kind of jumping up and down about uh, privileged users, right? System administrators uh, saying, oh, well, it's, it's a sysadmin problem, right? Snowden, sysadmin, thus and ergo, all insider threats are, inside, are an insider threat problem. Well, the problem is, let's see what Joe says. Uh, Joe says not so much. So when we look at these 200 cases and we look at the espionage cases, 1.5% of the espionage cases were actually privileged users, 1.5%. And then if you look at our internal incidents, less than 1% had to do with privileged users. Now I'm not saying that privileged user management isn't important. That's important for many, many reasons, for data loss, accidental data loss, having some guy accidentally you know, drop an entire network because you didn't, you didn't properly manage them. But building programs on one example is a really lousy idea. And I can tell you that because we kind of did that with Robert Hansen when we started as an insider threat program. We overly fit our detection to a very small amount of cases, one or two, and we came up with lousy results, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, when we talk to IT sabotage, that's probably the one area where 90%, according to Carnegie Mellon University, are gonna be sysadmins. So it depends on where your focus is, right? Uh, so IT sabotage, maybe more likely that it's a system administrator, but as far as intellectual property, espionage, fraud, waste, and abuse, much less likely. And why is that? Well, let's think about it. A guy that works counterintelligence as a special agent in the FBI knows counterintelligence like that. You know, most sysadmins I know um, don't really know that kind of information. They know the network and they know stuff like that. Yeah, they can do a smash and grab operation, but uh, if you look at, again, like a Hanson who can laser focus, steal things, and provide it to the right people, can do far, far more damage. 
So let's talk a little bit about the intrusion kill chain, right? Everybody knows this, this is great stuff done by uh, uh, Lockheed Martin and Hutchins and Kloppert. Uh, great, this is really great. Most people are using this for APT, right? Well, the problem is this doesn't work for insider threat because insider threats don't need to do things like weaponization and reconnaissance. So what I've come up with is kind of a suggested insider threat kill chain. And, and I'll refer back to this in a future slide, but you have this kind of recruitment tipping point when people kind of decide to go bad or start going bad. They start kind of doing search and reconnaissance, and by the way, this can be very, very, very small if they work the problem set all of the time. They kind of, they, they acquire the data and they work to exfil it some way, shape, or form. Okay, the other thing that's kind of unique to insider threats, especially when you get into industrial espionage, is this concept of kind of operational security. One thing that we found very often is people look over their back a lot. Why? Because they're getting paid for stealing that next flat screen and going to work for a competitor. Well, that means they need to stay in place and steal the data. And if you kick them out too early, they're not going to make the payday. So, kind of think more towards this inside a threat kill chain. And again, getting into that concept of authorized user doing authorized things for malicious purposes. <clears throat> So the other thing in this, again, no, no ranking on any specific vendor, uh, but beware of this kind of silver, silver bullet. It, as Snowden came out, you know, and I get all of the standard kind of emails and everything like that. I got, I think last time I checked, it was 16 like emails about Snowden. Oh, our product helps stop Snowden. Are you Snowden ready? That was my favorite. Are you Snowden ready? <laughs> That's like ridiculous. Um, and look, I understand everybody's got to eat. Right, so I understand, you know, vendors' job is to push their stuff, but it just really doesn't work often. Um, and again, you know, come up, oh, I, I fixed the Snowden problem. I have an IPS I could put on your network and find now. Again, authorized user doing authorized things. If it's not doing some kind of behavioral analytics, and uh, and we'll talk to that, then I kind of don't believe it works. And there's definitely nothing with a big red button that says click here to catch spy. Well, maybe they do. Please show me where that is but it probably won't work. The, the, it, it, uh, so again, I understand, and I put up Ginsu knives because I just love it. Everybody knows like Ginsu knives are not from Japan. They were crappy knives that a failing company couldn't, couldn't move off the shelves, so they came up with a new way to, to spin it, right? They're Ginsu, they're from Japan. Well, you can do the same thing with, with stuff. Hey, I can Snowden proof your network. It's just ridiculous, I love that. I might make a t-shirt that says, I am Snowden proof. Uh, lesson two, and don't worry, the other lessons go a lot quicker. Um, this isn't a cybersecurity issue unto itself. We spent most of our time on things like legal issues, uh, training, and again, getting over the, kind, the, the concepts of, of how would you operate uh, an insider threat program. Uh, analytic training is one of a huge problem, right? Because you generally get people that do computer forensics or they do security operations center stuff, they're an intrusion analyst, and you slap them down and they, they immediately fall back into their, I want to write a snort sig to catch this. Uh, and I was one of those and you know, it just turns out it doesn't work. Um, so again, just keep that in mind that a lot of the things that you need to do is gonna be clearing the deck chairs for, for just being able to do the operations. Oh and by the way, if you're trying to do things like into, uh, insider threat intellectual property protection in places like the EU, how many folks are from the EU or do work in the EU here? Probably a lot, right? Uh, Germany? Yeah. So Germany, you know, you can't, in some instances, like an IP address cannot be collected because they think it's, it, they would consider that private information. Well, when you start, when you start talking about some of these techniques, you're going to go through a lot of legal wranglings to, to get it to work. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. So, you know, the solution is you really got to take this multidisciplinary approach. Okay. And that is by, the whole goal is to detect, deter, and disrupt insider threats using different than just cybersecurity, uh, counterintelligence and intelligence approaches, and personnel security, and you do it simply by focusing on the people, enemy, and the data. This is basically the roadmap. It took us 10 years to come up with this. It's, it's mind-bogglingly simple, but it's also very, very important. And we'll talk about a little bit of this, because a lot of folks don't do this, especially the people part, right? That's one of the hardest things is knowing your people. A lot of people go, oh, I, oh no, I, we, we track our people, right? We have an EAD or we have an active directory and I get an LDAP query from that and I got their usernames, I'm done. Like absolutely not, that, that's like the beginning of the concept. Um, you know, pretty simple concepts. You need things like HR information. So here, I'll give you a free indicator. A spike in printing on a Friday night, does that matter? 
I don't know, right? Spike in printing on a Friday night, and the guy was told on Friday morning that he was going to be fired on Monday. Now do I care? It's usually what we call a clue at the FBI. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the problem is something that simple can't be done if you don't have a direct feed from HR saying, hey, this is the guy we're firing, and then you know what that username is. And again, it sounds really, really simple, but just trying to get the legal hurdles and also just technologically set up like that. But it really is critical, and I'll show you why and a little bit more why it's even more critical. Uh, this concept of the whole person approach, right? That you can't just look at somebody and what they do on the computer. You gotta look at other things, like contextual. What I gave you before was HR, that's a context of a given individual and their actions. The other one is cyber, that's pretty easy, that's what most people in here are gonna be f feel pretty comfortable with, you know? System maps and uh, app logs and system logs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The last great frontier is this kind of psychosocial. Uh, I'm not the, the expert to talk here, there's actually a talk we gave at RSA about psychosocial indicators. If anything might be able to predict insider threat, it's probably psychosocial. The problem with psychosocial is things like, uh, let's say all insider threats have narcissism, right? Okay, go detect everyone in a 75,000 person organization with narcissism. Go. Why are you still sitting here? Go to, the problem is you have no idea how to actually turn that into, into effective indicators. And some of the things that, that, that uh, the Bureau and others are working on. But it, it's a very, very tough thing. And also, by the way, they have to differentiate. Right? So differentiation has to do with keeping that test and control group aside. If everyone's a narcissist, that's not a good thing to, to, to focus on. And remember, the joke is always, I'm not a nar narcissist, I'm awesome, you're a narcissist. Uh, know your enemy. This is kind of this concept of reverse targeting. And I'm not talking about uh, attack vectors. This isn't phishing. Phishing isn't an enemy. That's an attack vector that somebody might use. This concept of kind of reverse targeting. And this is a little bit more of a counterintelligence approach. Some people do this, some people don't. But you as an organization, you sat down and said, okay, I'm a video game company. What are we working on that's gonna make us money for the next five years? Who is working on that and who is interested in that data? And if you just start kind of focusing your thought process on the enemy and who they're interested in, again, not systems, systems are irrelevant, okay? I would argue systems have been irrelevant to InfoSec for like 10 years, we just haven't noticed. What's relevant is the data object or the data that's on the systems and the people accessing them. Um, you know, and this could be a fairly simple tabletop exercise. So you started with the statement that most internal threats are joined without malicious intent. Correct. So let's say you work for a video game company, okay? And I'm, uh, you're Acme Corp and I'm Beta Corp, okay? So Acme Corp has a new, brand new video game that's starting, and Beta, that, that you guys are gonna make money on forever and ever and ever. And you know in the past, Beta Corp has tried to beat you to market every dime. I'm the enemy, Beta Corp's the enemy. For, you don't need to know now what you can do is say, knowing Beta Corp's enemy, Beta Corp is likely to do things like go after your people, try to hire them, and they're not gonna go after randoms, they're gonna go after people with the closest access to the most significant data. Does that make sense? Right, so they are sort of which you're saying they do that. No, I'm not. You, 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 you're just a user that works on really sensitive stuff is naturally more risky because they may be targeted by the enemy or the competition. Does that make sense? So you sitting there as an Acme Corp employee have no malicious intent whatsoever and you're happy or maybe you're a little overworked, maybe you're getting a little PO'd and then Beta Corp calls up and goes, how about I triple your salary, I give you a $300,000 bonus, all you gotta do is bring, up, bring, all, uh, bring all of your uh, uh, coding that you've been doing over the last two years with you. You had no malicious intent when you got hired. You went through, and we'll talk about this, this continuum that got to insider threat. Last one, and then, go ahead. They are absolutely your most valuable pros. Maybe, right? This is all the things that as di different, as different, so the question was, aren't some of these most high value employees, and if you're gonna start putting like Big Brother all over them, they're gonna get pissed off, burn the French, and they're gonna run to Beta Corp because you're doing this to them, possibly. But also if you kind of, in my experience, and again, the federal government's very, very different. You re remove that expectation of privacy. But you can do these things logically. And if somebody's coming in and you're paying them logically well, and they understand, and we'll talk about this crowdsourcing security, idea, I found that individuals tend to really like to, that's their baby, right? And they want to protect what they're doing. And they tend to understand when you inform them what you're doing. 
What you don't do is do it in the background and not tell anyone because that's what pisses them off. Is that answered? So let me crank through a couple more of these things. That answer the question, guys? Right. Uh, so we kind of already hit this, right? We kind of talked about this Acme Betacorp concept. Know the data. What's the, what's the really important stuff? The problem is usually when people talk about asset control and security, they always talk about systems. That just pisses me off. I don't know why it makes me so angry, but maybe because I get angry at really odd things. Um, but they always say, oh, no, I have asset I, I, right here. Here's all the systems I have in the patch level. Okay. What do all of the people using that use those things for? What, which one of, if you lose a laptop A or a laptop B, which one are you going to freak out about more? Well, I don't know. That's not asset, that's not asset discovery. Well, yeah, it is. You need to, again, know, know the data, know your people, know your enemy. Well, some things people say, well, this sounds really expensive, right? And it might be expensive to do. Uh, I think you could do it right and for far less than what we did it for. But this is another thing that you have to kind of consider. When you talk about return on investment as security professionals, you know, maybe we could do a little bit better. And this is a bit of a soapbox issue, but our go-to thing is a chicken little thing, right? Is to tell, freak everybody out, tell them how the world's ending. How about we start talking about value to the customer and value to the company? Well, a good insider threat program, a good data protection program allows you to do things like penetrate hostile marketplaces. Go do work in the most hostile marketplace. I don't care, because our, our crap can't get stolen. That's a, that's like a, that, that's actually, a, that's a market differentiator for industries. And I, I mean, mark my words, I say in about five years, 10 years, people that take insider threats seriously will be around and people that don't won't. Because it's just, as we get better and better and better, finding APT and all that stuff and that could drops down, the easiest thing to do is just flip somebody on the inside, right? And arguably cheaper. So let's go on to the next lesson. How are we doing? We're about 26 minutes in, we're good. Lesson three. Focus on deterrence. This kind of talks a little bit about, and this is kind of antithetical to a lot of people that do security on this. We want to be in the background, totally quiet, and not tell anybody we're there because we're terrified that if they figure out how we're catching them, we're going to miss them. Well, I would argue that that's not the best way of going about it. What you want to do is create an environment. Remember I talked about that knucklehead problem? Well, what are you going to do about the knuckleheads? Just let them keep on being stupid? No. You've got to interact with them and you got to train them, and you got to socially engineer them towards something that you want them to be. So this is, again, making this concept of, of kind of rumble strips of the road. Somebody starts doing something wrong, burnt, you knock them back into place, right? And you can do this on a bunch of different things. Maybe it's an HR thing, maybe it's a computer security thing. Maybe that guy that's, that's working on your next great video game is getting a little angry, you find him in an incident, maybe you could talk to the guy, get him, I don't know, a shiatsu massage and see if he's feeling a little bit better at the end of the day. Um, it's all of this idea that, that we do in, as security professionals that's just wrong, right? We take one problem, Snowden, and we just generalize that across everything. Don't get me wrong, it sells software, but it doesn't solve any problems. What we need to do is make logical risk decisions, right? So what do we do at the Bureau with this? Uh, we did this thing that we call, or I call crowdsourcing security. It's a crazy idea. You actually trust your users, you provide them, you assume most of them are good, but you trust but verify. You actually provide them the tools to secure their own data. Don't get me wrong, you're watching this entire thing, and you lay back and see what happens. This is a complete head turn on how we normally do in the federal government. Normally, federal government, you have a centralized security policy capability, and you're just a force out from that, and you really don't care what the end users say. Well, this idea kind of came from this guy, Francis Galton, or, or Galton, depending on how you want to pronounce it. He's a eugenist. A eugenist is a nice way of saying he's basically an economic racist. The idea is that if you're rich, well, it's true. If you're rich, you're smart. If you're poor, you're stupid. And one of the things he did is he took a, a bunch of oxen, and he prayed them in front of a bunch of unwashed Irish farmers and they had biologists guess how how heavy they were and then had the farmers and then lo and behold when he took the average of all of those the subject matter experts were way wrong compared to the people that used and worked with the oxen every single day so the light bulb kind of went off in my head saying we do the same thing with data right we try to dictate onto a programmer what is important to that person that's ridiculous. The only person that really knows that is that programmer. Don't get me wrong, you need to give them framework and you need to give them how to do that, but you let them do it yourself. This was kind of hilarious doing it as a bureau and this is one of the reasons why. I got into like screaming matches with people, InfoSec people, security people, that told me that our users are too stupid to use removable media devices. They're too stupid, that's what I was told. 
Like that's interesting. 14,000 of them come to work every day with a gun on their hip. <laughs> and we can't tra train them how to use a USB. And by the way, I love ThinkGeek. A friend of mine got me that, that, that gun USB device. It was absolutely spectacular. The, the, the point here is that we got to kind of change up the game, right? So the problem was the InfoSec guys. The InfoSec guys and gals were just making, again, these gigantic risk-averse decisions, applying it to everybody, and not budging. So we changed that. So what do we do? And this is like painfully easy and super, super stupid and silly, but it worked really well, which was kind of embarrassing. So, interact with users. Normally we would, we used to do, and we still do, yearly infosec training. You sit through this really painful thing and then, you know, people come up and try to like, you know, a guy that has like a Russian accent that smokes cigarettes like this comes up and like tells you to give him, you know, to give you data, to steal data from, it's terrible. People hate it, but we still make them do it. Well, and then we were also doing things like website prompting for all websites. That didn't work because nobody really paid attention. So we started doing things like, wait, what do we care about? Do we care that somebody goes to Facebook? Or do we care when people, for instance, take sensitive data and try to put it up to Facebook? And do we care about everyone or only those people that are doing it? Well, we only care about those people that are doing those specific risky behaviors. So all we did is deploy really, really, really focused, basically, pop-ups and user interaction. And it didn't even stop you. It said, say, accept or abort. Oh, by the way, if you don't know the policy, click right here. So stupid, right? But the problem is it had like this really tremendously good effect on the knuckleheads. So this is what we are showing is people clicking accept versus clicking abort over time. Now, this is what's interesting when I say we kind of changed behavior. Because what you would have expected them to see is you would have expected the aborts to pop way up, right? And the accepts to go down. Well, now what happened is people actually stopped doing the behavior. <laughs> They stopped it. So they never even got to the point of saying accept or abort. So the abort stayed more or less same and they just stopped doing it. It was crazy. And again, we did this in basically a year. So uh, the, the point there is now we take knucklehead, we automate out the problem, we crowdsource the security, we start giving people the, the, the capabilities to help us do our jobs and we can take our finite amount of resources and point out the really difficult problems like catching spies. Makes sense, right? All righty, lesson four, the data overload problem. Um, this is very normal for almost any security professional, right? Let's collect absolutely effing everything and for, we worry about what we do about it later, right? Full network packet capture, I want like, everything. Well, here's the problem with that. This is us starting our D, starting our insider threat program, and then just this massive data explosion, okay? Tools start really failing really, really, really fast when you start getting into those high levels. You, ever try, you, you ain't running grep on 2.2 petabytes of information. Well, you can, it just won't work. So you, you buy yourself into this gigantic problem set, right? And don't get me wrong, there's, uh, we, we're not gonna rail on big data. There's technologies, Hadoop stores and virtualized clusters and all sorts of cool stuff you can do with huge, huge data. But that presumes that all that data is important. And one of the things is that most of that data is important. The big question is kind of what happened, right? What happened with our user base? Well, this is what happened with our user base, is they started using data differently. And yes, every time someone says BYOD, God kills a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> Having, <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> well, it's like, well, it's I, get, I get the applause on killing kittens. Um, I like kittens. I said this differently in a, in a different talk and people are like, FBI kills kittens. I like kittens. They are delicious. And they're, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, what happened with our user base is what happened with everybody's user base. Data is expected to be everywhere always and people want to be anywhere always and get at the data. So all of a sudden, most of the data starts getting spread out and we're running around trying to catch it all. By, by the way, is BYD going anywhere? No, I'm sorry it's not. Wave bye bye to the idea. It's going, and all, by the way, how long have we been doing BYOD? The answer is forever. Right now, I mean, it, it, OWA, Outlook, web access, giving people access to email remotely, they ain't doing that always on, on corporate, corporate hardware. So the, the issue is, is that as we have this data explode under us because the way people are using data changed, what do we do? Well, we can focus on the data. So, what I would provide, what I would suggest to you is there's two primary data sources. If you had a dollar to spend on insider threat, you'd spend it here. It's not packet capture, 
It's not antivirus, it's not that. It's two data sources. One is HR, right? And that's not just the people. Ideally, it's HR and the feeds. Action's happening and normative analysis on a given user's normal behavior. And specifically, and I'll show you some of the data, we looked at data ingress, ingress and egress and volumetric anomalies and therein. Okay, so we looked at volumetric anomalies, how big? We looked at frequency anomalies, we looked at a lot of stuff. Frequency, volume, um, time, so uh, rapidity, how rapidly they did, and we tried to see which one of those, again, is classifying against the control and the bad guy. Okay, so let's take a look. This brings us kind of lesson five. Detection of insider threats, kind of hard. Anybody read the book uh, Black Swan by Taleb? It's a spectacular book, yeah, great book. I uh, highly suggest it. So basically push comes to shove what it says, and there's a lot of uh, actual empirical evidence back this up, is that predicting events, really rare events, may actually be impossible, okay? Well, that's kind of a big deal because most insider threat programs, and even with all due deference to the executive order, is pushing this idea is you gotta predict them. You gotta, you gotta predict before they become bad and you're gonna, you know, kind of like this future crimes division from that, uh, what was that? Uh, Minority Report? Thank you, that was the one with like three people and they're like in KY Jelly and yeah. That one. Was, <laughs> we have those by the way, Bureau has those. <laughs> I always was like, why are they in KY Jelly? This is very strange to me. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> but the point on this is don't waste time and money on basically the impossible and I'll tell you, you're looking for red flags as we call indicators over time. And we talked about this a little bit, right? This insider threat continuum, when I said People usually come in, right? They're not insiders, they're here, they're bright-eyed, bushy-tails. Then, you know, as they start to work, their, their hopes and dreams get crushed slowly. And then they start realizing what's going on. Now, normal people, I'd hate to say normal people, hit a tipping point, and what would a normal person do if they're in a job that they hate? Quit. Quit. What's really interesting, when you, when you listen to the transcripts of some of the, the, the espionage, uh, of the, some of the spies, Hanson, Pitts, some of the big ones, right? Almost all of them say the same thing. And again, I'm not, I'm not a psychologist. They say, I had no choice. My back was up against the wall, I had no choice. Pitt's a perfect example. This guy has got a law degree, been in the bureau for, I can't remember, 15 years, something like that. He could have easily gotten a job. And this is back when the job market was pretty decent. Um, so they somehow think they're trapped. It's, it's kind of odd. But the point is, is that relying on forecasting and predictive analysis towards a tipping point where somebody might just literally quit because they're normal or go become a spy, again, it's probably too variable to predict. What I'm suggesting is, again, you use that positive crowdsourcing, that crowdsourcing and positive social engineering, get that environment uncomfortable for an insider to thrive in, tap down the problem, and go after diagnostic analytics, which means actually find diagnosing actual insiders operating in your control group. Then you're preventing, but then you're finding them if they find them. Find them, tackle them, tag them, bag them, get them out, okay? And you know, over time, as you have an environment where it's really difficult to be an insider, all you gotta do is make it more difficult than the next guy, right? It's like that ADT sign on your house. They ain't break it into your house, they're gonna go next door. So somebody could go work for like the State Department for, it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. So the problem with prediction. Everybody know Puxitani Phil? For those of you that are not Americans, let me explain Puxitani Phil. Puxitani Phil is a, 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 uh, a long-standing honor tradition in America. Once a year, we take a rodent, that rodent, that's basically a large rat, and uh, two kind of drunk people talk to him and ask him if we're gonna have a long winter. And the rodent tells them, and then we put it in the newspaper because it's a slow news day and everybody goes, oh, did you hear that Puxitani Phil saw his shadow? It's completely ridiculous. Uh, but here's the funny thing. So Puxitani Phil, what, how many chances does he have? What two, he has two choices, right? So random would be what? 50%, right, flip of a coin. He's 60% accurate going back 25 years, I found. Kind of cool, right? <laughs> Here's the funny part. Our initial beta system for insider threat detection mechanism, when we went back and actually looked at it, you know, using science and stuff, was worse than random. <laughs> so let me just let that, <laughs> so let that sink in for five seconds. A rodent, 
was more predictive than our initial system, which I'm immensely proud of, by the way. So I, I, I always said, like, we should just get Puxatani Phil and, like, wave him like, spy? No, okay. Spy? No. <laughs> like, oh, he grunted. <laughs> oh, Lord. Now, having said that, we didn't ever do that. Because apparently your PETA gets really PO'd if you have rodents. So we couldn't have a rodent. So how do you do it, right? The problem is, again, you have this cacophony of people, most of which are there trying to do their jobs, some of which might be doing something odd because they're slightly angry, and maybe some start looking like an insider, uh, and they're just going to quit. Well, what you do is pretty simple. You, again, like we said, don't try to predict them look at those things that are differentiating, specifically behavioral detection. Okay, and we'll talk about this um, and some of the mistakes we made. Again, think more like a marketer than an IDS, an, uh, IDS analyst. So real quick, sorry we're doing, we're 40 minutes in. Uh, so this came to me, so I was in California and I was buying shoes. I was buying shoes in a Nike outlet and my Amex got flagged, right, no big deal. But I wasn't buying a lot, so I was interested. So I talked to the person, and I'm like, how, how did you flag? And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we unlocked it. I'm like, no, I literally want to know how you flag. So this poor, poor woman that, that was probably, I don't know where she was, but I kept her on the, on the phone until I got to somebody who said, why did you flag? And that guy, and he could have been lying to me, by the way, but I don't know. I thought it was cool. He said, the reason we flagged you is because of this. We've never seen you buy. It's locational, which I understood. I'm usually in D.C., and now I'm in California. The number of shoes you bought at one point is different and we never saw you buy them in this color. <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of spooky. You think we're good? You think the Bureau's good? I'd worry about your credit card companies. <laughs> so I'm like, that's freaking terrifying because I was buying some pink shoes. They were for my daughter. <laughs> I happened to get them in men's 10 because she likes wearing large shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, insert J. Edgar Hoover jokes here. <laughs> the, the, point, the point was is that kind of like light bulb we brought back to the team and said, you know what, what they're doing there is they're doing behavioral analytics on individuals. So we started looking down the behavioral analytic track, and let me show you what, what happened. We started doing what people would normally do, right? Behavioral analytics. What we're going to do is we're going to take the average of what people do on, let's say, data ingress and egress. And by the way, I, I point to that is because uh, Carnegie Mellon University, um, some folks up at uh, Columbia, a lot of them point to that as potentially a differentiator. So we took everybody's average, and then we took our control group and looked at average, and you know what we found? Absolutely no statistical rel relevance whatsoever. Anybody know what happened? Any, anybody want to guess? Anybody know what a normal distribution is? We normalized the bad guys, and also we did the worst thing, right? Did a assumption. When you assume, you make an ass out of you and umption. What? <laughs> that's stupid. So what this is, this is a 10 mark bill. Um, that's Gauss. Gauss is called a Gaussian curve. It's so ingrained in us statistically thinking, right? Whenever anybody went to like did math as a kid, they always talk about standard deviation from the mean. And that works great when you have a normal distribution. Little amounts of people do a little bit of the data, little amount of people do a lot of the data, and most of the data is moved by the masses in between. Here's the problem and why our prediction system was wicked off. This is a distribution of our users. That is not a black line, that is a distribution. So what we had is these massively skewed distributions. What happens when you try to take a standard deviation and put it on this data? <laughs> you get worse than a rodent prediction, right? So, you know, Puxatani apparently was better at math than us. The point with this was that what we found was when you, you dumb out, you, like I said, normalize everything out, it, it just, you just lose everything in the noise. So this is a terrible way of going about business. Though, you know, it concerns me because there's a lot of folks to include people that sell and are starting to sell insider threat detection mechanism that do precisely this. Take the standard deviation of everybody always doing stuff and use that. It's no good. Pat Reedy's opinion. So what we did do is we said, okay, screw that. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is do behavioral analytics on an individual, on yourself over time. That means you as a person, your averages or your norms, and when we said norms, we would take it on, on a given day, and then look that way. Now, we started finding differentiation. What we found was in a 90-day time frame, 
21% of the test users, those people that had incidents, actually showed spikes in 90 days versus 12 of the control. So immediately, this is a good, so what, anybody know what a rock curve is? So this is good and bad. What this shows is it's differentiating. That means that if this fires, you're about twice as likely to have a quote unquote bad person in your net than a good person. The problem is, is the detection rate still pretty lousy, right? 21%, that means eight out of 10 bad guys aren't gonna, you know, they are gonna not fire this one indicator, which goes back to the original thing, which is there's no silver bullet. You will never find, in Pat Reedy's opinion, and we never did in 10 years, a single indicator that always worked all of the time. Only when we started taking that kind of holistic, whole person approach, right? We started looking at the context, we started looking at psychosocial, we started looking, at, again, particularly with HR, and then overlaid your normal system behavior that we start actually finding true differentiation. So that's why when I say, if you could only, if you had one dollar to spend, spend it on two things, HR and then a user's normative behavior. Because if you, if you get that going, uh, you're kind of cooking with gas at that point. Now again, this is a bit antithetical to a lot of tools that you can buy. Because what's easy to do is just take everything that everyone's doing, average it, and find somebody's spike. And don't get me wrong, nobody's going to argue that if the average person moves 12 documents off your network in a day, and somebody moves 200,000, that you should probably look at that. <laughs> I, I mean, I understand that. I'm not arguing don't look at that at all. I'm just saying if you're really looking for differentiation and looking for diagnostics, this is what you need to, need to focus on. Okay, so kind of that's where we finally ended up. Now, one of the things that we're now going to go do, or, or my ex team's now going to go do, is overlay these findings with the psychosocial stuff that we did in, in uh, RSA last year, and then see what the detect rates are. Because ideally, the perfect detect rate, and this is kind of a rock curve idea, fires 100% of the time with a bad guy and 0% of the time with a good guy. Now, that's going to be more or less impossible. But, um, you know, as you kind of work that curve towards that issue. And this is, you know, this is important. Again, it goes to the, what we say, uh, insider threats wear shirts. 100% correct. Well, I hope, most time. How about insider threats have skin? Let's go there. Um, insider threats have skin most of the time, again, I hope. Um, except Skeletor, who's the worst. <laughs> uh, and everyone else does as well. So it's, if it's equally true with both populations, it's no good. So again, looking for those, uh, those controls and indicators. So it looks like I'm about, I wanted to have 10 minutes or so for questions and answer. So let me just kind of, so f summing up those five things real quickly. They're not hackers, right? Remember that. Uh, frame the threat and start working your analytic techniques appropriately. Take a look at the inside of the threat kill chain, please. If you guys, and, you know, if you guys uh, find it interesting, please you know, let me know. And by the way, for the folks leaving, remember doing feedback. Please do feedback. Sir? So it's a hero or a criminal? I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not touching that. Sorry, he asked me if Snowden a hero or a criminal. I'm not touching that. I'm not. He was an unauthorized disclosure, a disclosure. I will leave it at that. My personal opinion, actually wait, I'm a private citizen. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, you know, I, was he a whistleblower? Maybe he thought he was a whistleblower. The way he did it, I absolutely disagree with, period. Okay, so people can disagree. And again, if you're gonna get angry at me, buy me drinks and heap, heap scorn on me. But certain things are kept secret for a reason. Everybody says they want information free, until it's your information. And think about that. I don't want free information. Well, if the information's free, well, don't get me started. So, oh, we're gonna start, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, what do you mention the following Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Data. So I'll put a pause on that. For everybody leaving, A, thank you, and B, please do the feedback 
So it either allows me to not ever come back here and talk and bore you again, or if it does. So thank you, and I'll, I'll stay here and keep on questions. Cheers. The, so the, the comment here, as I heard it, is that, uh, the, that essentially often normal users and bad guys can kind of meld together and that the, the utilization of data loss prevention tools was very helpful in your case. I, I would absolutely agree on that. You know, one of the tools in our toolbox of data loss prevention done well with kind of understanding that, you know, it's not a hacker problem, don't write policies and things trying to find hackers, we, we found real great stuff. So my, my rail against vendors wasn't that there's no good technology there. DRM, DLP, there's some really spectacular technology out there, but like everything, it's a tool and you need to know how to use it. Sir. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I think you yeah, absolutely. You and I are speaking the same language. So what I was talking about is actions, I mean if we go back to this slide real quick, and actions or what we called observables in these three major categories. So what I was doing in this presentation was focusing on on observables and actions on the cyber side. But absolutely, just like I said, like is going to be fired like a specific action within contextual, a, a, a flight overseas or a bad credit rating or something, that any of it is an observable. And an observable needs to be something that you can, is an action or something that you can record or see. So, so, the, so, the, so the question was, am I, am I advocating like an automatic HR feed or person or just like kind of a person? I would say ultimately you'd want an automatic feed of those observables that you think are important to you. However, if all you can get is an HR person to sit down with you every month, take that. I mean, if, if that's all you can get, that is huge. Like, so whatever you can get, but ultimately you would have a feed into the insider threat uh, program of all the HR data, of what relevant HR data. And again, that's going to have legal pr issues, and that's going to have to be something that you get, you get your privacy folks and everybody to sign off on. But it's going to be different. So hold on, because I already asked you, sir. Oh, hallelujah, yeah, yeah. And then based on that, we can actually move on the and basically look at what people move the most from that. Oh yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So they, they said, what about what about data classification, understanding sensitivity? Um, that's again goes back to know your data. Absolutely. If you go down to like these these this slide past the dead kitten, towards <laughs> you know these right, as you start salami slicing, slicing further and further down into um, into behavioral analytics, what we have found is if you can do like so spikes on somebody printing against yourself is interesting. Spikes on somebody printing against yourself of sensitive data is more interesting. So absolutely, as you slide, it's, it's, it, the more you know and the more dimensions you can give on it, the more differentiating it becomes. So absolutely, I was just in here, you know, sometimes the problem is a boil the ocean problem and inside a threat, because so people start thinking, if I don't have data classification, if I don't have an automatic feed in HR, if I don't, I can't do any of this, right? Well, no, you can start doing some of this simply with a person from HR and, you know, with some pretty simple logging. It, it's sure. It's funny you mentioned that, and I actually didn't have any slides because I thought it was a little too much to cover. Is that we have an ontology, a, a, a indicator ontology that we started actually working with Carnegie Mellon University uh, that we're looking at doing a reference implementation in OWL. So literally, what you'd be able to do is, is abstract abstract out indicators in the in those three buckets and actually apply them to different whatever log stores you may have. 
um, I could, I could, if you give me a card, I could, I could, I could send you some information on that. I don't. Again, I'm a private sector guy now, so I, I don't know where they are as of the last couple of weeks. They were still working on it. I'm assuming they, they still are. But um, I had a backup slide, but I don't. I could show you that later. Sure. Oops, sir. Yeah, then I'll get you. I'm sorry. Uh, let's do. Sorry, he was up first. Yeah. Sure. So running, running false, uh, running false flags, and uh, doing things like honey tokens, and, and uh, absolutely could fit right in there. When this was had to do with uh, kind of detection uh, based on uh, on kind of behavioral analytics. More mature programs would link more things on top of that. So yeah, absolutely. You want to run a you, you can run uh, 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 honey token stuff uh, operations. You can run thank you denial deception operations. The only thing I would say is doing that as a starting point, I, I would argue is too much too soon. Because if let's say you do a false flag, right, and somebody picks up a fill in the blank, they, they log into something they shouldn't or they pick up a piece of data, your immediate questions are gonna jump into HR type of questions. Who is this guy? What does he do for a living? How much access does he have to what system? How much does he get paid? Where does he live? And so if you don't have the kind of foundation, I would say that's kind of like green belt, maybe a little bit higher, purple, purple belt insider threat ops. And this is like white belt, yellow belt type of conversation. But yeah, no, absolutely. Yes, sir. You mean before they came in? Oh, and then they flipped on the, oh, you know, that's really interesting. You know what? No, I don't, but that's a really interesting idea. So you're talking about, so like, somebody goes from Acme Corp to Beta Corp, and then they, from Beta Corp to, to Zeta Corp on the same, that's really interesting. No, I haven't, now I want to. That's kind of, that's a cool idea. That, that'd be like a, like a recidivism type of view. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a nice, that's a, True, but now this is interesting, like this, this, how can they do this to people multiple times? Uh, you know, I don't know, because that's kind of the initial time. But that, that's, that's an interesting idea. Huh. Maybe I'll do that next year of the talk. Sir, and then I got somebody, well actually, hold on, give me one second, right here. Uh, HR data, um, I, I hate to say almost everything, but that's, a, but at least, at least terminations, higher fire events. Um, promotions, demotions, movement of one group to another, all that stuff's important. And, and what's also just like, uh, by the way, I'd also say that stuff is golden for APT, uh, you know, because advanced persistent threat folks, they're, this is, they're not going after a system, they're going after pieces of information and they're targeting people. Uh, it works a lot very, very well with that too. So th those kind of couple of things I would say, if you could start just with that, the rest of the stuff is nice to have and anything that we may have, I don't want to discuss, the bureau had, I wouldn't want to discuss, but um, usually when you start getting into things like pay and people really heavily private information that's not just corporate, it gets a little sticky. But if you get just those, what, five things, I think you're in good shape. I had somebody over here, where is it? Yes, sir. Oh. The question is, have you ever seen an insider threat in conjunction with an outside actor like fraud? So without getting into specifics, so the question is, have I seen external threat actors operating in concert with, inter with internal threat actors? The, I can't give you a specific, but the answer is yes, and on more than one occasion. So, so keep, keep in mind, again, if you go to the advanced persistent threat problem and you say it's, let's say we will assume it's a state-sponsored cyber adversary issue, okay? I'm not saying it is or it is, and we'll just assume that. Um, sta nation states that are running in intelligence operations don't just run cyber operations, they run human operations too. So it's, we do it, they do it, it'd be, it'd be very, very common. So the answer is yes, I just, I'm not, I can't, get into specifics, but absolutely. And by the way, it's a good point. Uh, I often want to knock people's heads together when they're talking about APT as this like ethereal thing out in the universe of evil and having no correlation back to, again, insider threat programs. You need to answer and collect the same data to combat APT as you do to combat insider threats. Who are my people? What are they working on? What's my most in interesting information? What's going to put me out of business in five years if someone steals it? And the threat knows that. 
and they're not nice enough to only kind of like try to break in on the computer systems, they're gonna, it's an intelligence op. So they're going to do things like try to flip people internally. It's just if you're seeing it or not. That's, that's somebody else bouncing around, no? Quit, we gotta quit. Thank you very much everybody. Uh, and I can answer questions on the hallway. Thank you very much.